Uh, so I'm just going to get right into it. Uh, so my talk is on Apple's rapid security response. Uh, title, Apple's not so rapid security response. So what are the bill of materials for this talk? So I want to talk about what is a rapid security response? What gaps does it fill? What is the underlying technology that makes it work? Uh, how do they work? And where do they fall short? As well as why are they no longer used? And where, we might be, they, where they might secretly be hiding today? So before I get too much into this, who am I? My name is Mukola Grimaliuk. I am the lead security and software engineer for Repita Consulting, a small IT company out in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. I do a lot of security research there. I have some CVs with Apple, Jamf, VMware, so forth. I also am the project lead of OpenCore Legacy Patcher. So the idea is that how do you get old Macs running newer operating systems to give them a few more years of life? Uh, finally, I have a blog, chronokernel.com, where I document a lot of my work. So let's get right into it. What is a rapid security response? It's a security update that comes out faster than other security updates. Yeah, that's completely worthless. Uh, so back at WWDC 2022, Apple unveiled Mac OS 13 Ventura and iOS 16. And with these two, we got like 30 seconds of a mention of a new software update system called rapid security response. So what gaps does it fill? Why did Apple feel they need to introduce the system? There are three main goals you can see, or gaps that it fills. So one is to quickly handle zero days. Up to this point, Apple has been fairly slow to patch zero days. Uh, sometimes you would see them actively exploited and on the news, and it's like there's no software update. And so they need to get them patched more quickly. Two is to reduce the update times and reboots required. The less hassle it is for a user, the more likely they are going to install it. And then finally, three is the ability to revert updates. Up to this point, when you install a software update, you're stuck there. Either you install another operating system side by side and move files over, or you just live with it. And so if a software update breaks your workflow, so software compatibility, so forth, you're stuck. So let's look at RSR versioning. So of course, macOS follows the major, minor patch versioning, and rapid security response is a bit weird. It's space, and bracket, letter, bracket. So what would a rapid security response look like on Mac OS 15.1.1 and iOS 18.1.1? Well, the first rapid security response to release would be A. Something to keep in mind is also the build versions do change as well. So if you look on the host volume in systemversion.plist, it's the regular version 24B91. But if you look on this weird volume, the cryptex, we can see 24B880910B. So then what is the underlying technology that makes this work? So let's actually roll back to iOS 14 with Apple's security research device program. So this was unveiled in, or, or this was released in early 2021, and it was launched with an iPhone 14 and a special iPhone 11 that was labeled an SDR or security research device. And security researchers were given this new cryptex system to do their research and development with. So then how do these RSRs, or really cryptexes, work? So if we look at the preboot volume of a Mac, it's under system, volumes, preboot, OS, UUID, this is unique to each OS installation, cryptex1 slash current, there's two disk images of note. There is os.dmg and app.dmg. os.dmg, as you can imagine, is very critical to the operating system. It holds frameworks and the DLID shared cache, and it is grafted, or mounted, to system cryptexes OS. And app.dmg, as the name suggests, is more user space applications that are standalone. So this is primarily Safari, but you might also see uh, Apple's password manager sitting there as well. And this is grafted to system Cryptex's app. Cryptex's themselves are mounted via apfs.kext, and they are validated with a root hash and include a trust cache. And they are applied using an rdiff10 format. This is unique to them that was introduced with Mac OS Ventura and iOS 16. So if we look inside an RSR payload, we get four files that are of note. So we get cryptex app, that makes sense, that is the app.dmg's patch, and cryptex system uh, dash arch. Uh, that's because the os.dmg is architecture specific, so Intel and Apple Silicon have different DMGs. But what's that rev there? Well, that's because RSRs cannot be patched on top of each other. So if let's say A comes out and then B, 
Well, Apple has to revert A on your machine before B installs. So then how does Apple patch them? Under user lib, lib parallel compression .dlib, there is a raw image patch function and that takes a struct that is over there. There will be a sample uh, code at the end, uh, don't worry. And yeah, you just load up the library, give it a struct with some parameters, input, output, patch, and so forth, and you're off to the races. So here you can patch, of course, the os.dmg. Uh, this takes a long time, so I just threw in a photo. However, we also have for app.dmg, which actually runs very quickly. And voila, that's it. You have now updated your app.dmg with a rapid secure response. The best part is, you just restart Safari. You don't even have to reboot your Mac for app.dmg updates. And then of course, if we look inside the disk image itself, we can see, oh yeah, we got the new build version. We get a new product version extra, which is the A there. And so now if we look at how does Apple know which binary to use, like if you have an app that has a hard-coded library path, what does it do? So if we take test.bin and it's using Apple's demo.framework, for example, it wants to link with that framework, but it doesn't know exactly where it is. This is where the DLID comes in. The DLID will say, okay, I need to look through a whole bunch of paths to see where it is. And so with a rapid secure response, Apple can push it to the cryptex standalone. And so it'll say, hey, this is the top priority path I found, let's use it. And so then Mac, the DLID will let test.bin uh, link with demo.framework off of the cryptex volume. So now let's follow the macOS boot process. How does this all work in the mountain process? So we of course have boot.efi and XNU init on an Intel Mac. We have the kernel extensions load and we have a special kernel extension, apfs.kext. Uh, this is the file system kernel extension that Apple uses. Then of course user space starts up, user lib dlid starts up, and then uh, user lib dlid actually loads or uh, executes APFS graft function inside of APFS.kext. And so this is when the os.dmg and app.dmg grafting takes place. So then where do RSRs fall short? Kernel space updates. Of course, most people know what kernel space is, but just a quick overview. Kernel space is ring zero. It is the closest to the hardware uh, that you can imagine, and it's very highly privileged. Compare this to user space where it is lower privileged, it's more applications, command line, and the, if you are able to exploit the kernel, you basically have unfiltered access on the machine. There's some security mitigations in place, but we'll ignore those for now. So now let's talk about Apple's three-stage kernel caching system. This was introduced with Mac OS 11 Big Sur at Apple's Worldwide Developers Conference 2020, and it is comprised of three main systems. So there's the boot kernel collection. This is critical to booting, and it holds the kernel, XNU, as well as core drivers for booting. So of course, NVMe, APFS, and so forth. And this sits on the pre-boot volume. Then we have the system kernel collection. This is called the page full kernel collection internally and it holds graphics and audio and any additional drivers that Apple has developed. Something to note is that this is not used on Apple Silicon. They actually move it all over to that boot kernel collection. And this resides on the system volume. Finally, we have the auxiliary kernel collection. This is just third party drivers, uh, example RAID controllers and so forth. And you can see this as a bridge as while well Apple was developing driver kit. And this sits on the data volume. But is there something interesting with this? Well, it's because the system kernel collection actually sits on the system volume. Why does that matter? Well, we get to talk about kernel collection UUIDs and APFS snapshots. So each kernel cache has to be built together. They have a UUID that links them, and the reason why is that functions will, of course, have hard-coded offsets inside. If one kernel extension references a function in another, they can't have offsets change randomly because things will break. But then what about hot loading kernel extensions from an RSR or overlaying them, like maybe trying to readjust those paths? Well, funny enough, actually Apple killed that in Big Sur. This would have actually been possible with Mac OS Catalina with the pre-linked kernel cache architecture. Or, uh, yeah. So then why are APFS snapshots an issue? Why can't you just update all three caches? Well, there's multiple reboots to apply. So what's the point of a rapid security response if it's not rapid? You just push a regular security update. So then why are RSRs no longer used? 
it can still patch user space vulnerabilities and we see them from time to time. Well, let's look at macOS 13.4.1 ABC and iOS 16.5.1 ABC. So the timeline is pretty straightforward. We have 13.4.1 and iOS 16.5.1 release June 2021, or June 21st, 2021. Then sometime uh, late June, early July, CV 2023 was uh, stage four uh, patching discovered for Apple. And then 13.4.1a released. This was actually a WebKit vulnerability, so it made sense, it's user space only. And then all hell breaks loose because Apple breaks user agent parsing for a number of major websites, including Dropbox, Facebook, and so forth. So while this happens, Apple pulls 13.4.1a and recommends users uninstall the update if they're affected. Then B is devel developed internally, and then finally we see C pushed to the public two days later. So that's not fun, especially taking two days to fix an update uh, that is one technically a zero day because it's now no longer has a patch publicly available. And it broke a number of websites if you installed that update. That's not great for user experience. So what was the issue anyways? They removed letters from user agent parsing, or the user agent. Makes sense. So then where are RSR secretly hiding today? Well, RSRs themselves are no longer being used themselves. It's just a term. But there are technologies that are still hiding in the operating system. So of course we have Safari updates and actually Apple's private cloud compute system. So Safari updates are N minus one and N minus, or sorry, for your macOS versions that are N minus one and N minus two, so macOS Sonoma and macOS Ventura as of right now, they will actually get macOS updates and Safari updates separately. So here we see 18.0 being offered for a macOS Sonoma machine. And if we look at how Apple pulls it, oh, that's interesting, it's just a PKG in the software update catalog. Something else that's also interesting is that the developer betas for uh, Safari are also packaged in a similar way. Uh, and then uh, if we look inside the package itself, we actually see a cryptex. We get a weird digits there, uh, 0x62, 41, uh, 42150, random stuff, but we also see a root hash and a trust cache, which makes sense because that's what we see normally with a cryptex. And then if we follow inside, oh, that looks just like an app.dmg, neat. And then if we look in the post install script, we actually see a graph function, and there's even a command line utility. That's actually very interesting. But compared to a rapid security response, it doesn't support deltas or the ability to revert. So you install the Safari update and you're screwed. And then for Delta updates, you're getting a full 200 megabyte disk image. You're not getting a small five megabyte patch that you can quickly install. So then if we look at Apple's private cloud compute, they actually implement cryptexes quite heavily in the system. Uh, so I'm not gonna get too, too much into it because private cloud compute is a whole other subject. But they, of course, have a uh, debug shell cryptex, so you can easily mount that on the machine. And then you also have model weight cryptexes. Uh, so these are data only, which was the first we've seen, where it's only data being pushed, not uh, executable data. And of course, documentation there, highly recommend you read it. It's a lot of cool stuff in there. So rapid security response technologies live on, even if not directly through rapid security response updates. So back in April 2023, I asked the question, is rapid security response a failure? When I wrote that blog post, uh, there had not been a single public rapid security response. Uh, since then, we've had two, three public, um, and we had some betas as well. So let's look at macOS 15.1.1 and iOS 18.1.1. So if we look here, it's just JavaScript core and WebKit. That Seems pretty straightforward, aren't those user space? There doesn't seem to be anything for kernel. Well, Apple sometimes doesn't mention all the fixes they push, so maybe there's kernel hiding somewhere. Well, if we look at Blacktop's uh, IPSW diffs for 18.1 versus 18.1.1, it's user space only fixes. That's strange. 
So clearly, the security update could have just been a rapid security response if Apple had wanted to push it. So in conclusion, I think rapid security responses are pretty neat. However, they do have some unfortunate limitations. Uh, they do need to, of course, handle kernel space vulnerabilities. Um, they need to be able to handle kernel space vulnerabilities, but it's also clear Apple needs to add additional work to streamline the process to prevent, or to ensure that the security updates don't get pushed, that break things. Because user agent parsing should have been part of their CI pipeline. It's clearly something broke that they allowed that to push through. Uh, otherwise, thank you for listening to my rambles. I wanted to thank uh, Blacktop, Mr. McIntosh, Ascentian Bot, and DNOC. Uh, they all helped with this, either directly or indirectly. I also have my socials there, um, and also there's a QR code there for my blog post. Thank you.